My name is Aura Satz. I'm an artist who works with film and sound. Many of my works center on sound inscription, sound writing, and playback. And because of this, I'm particularly interested in women's voices and the ways in which they get heard or aren't heard enough and need to be recirculated. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this is one of our events uh, of the Unexpected View. Um, it's a program that we've introduced to the gallery quite recently, um, where we're inviting contemporary artists, artists working today, um, to come in and talk about their work um, in front of an artwork of their choosing. And it's quite a nice uh, idea um, where we get to kind of share the collection of the National Gallery, but also look at it, look at it in a very different way, from a different uh, point of view. Um, and through the amazing practices that artists are uh, creating uh, today. So uh, before we start, I'd like to thank um, Hiscox, uh, the contemporary art partner uh, with the National Gallery, for their support. And with their support, we're able to kind of um, have fantastic events like these where we're bringing artists into the gallery. Um, but also, they enabled us to have these events filmed. So after this, um, after t this evening, the, uh, a film will be made and will be available online for forevermore. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, it's with great pleasure that this evening um, we have the wonderful Aura Sats with us today. Um, Aura is an artist who is based here in London and, uh, and her work explores ideas around encryption and communication through our interaction with technologies and methods of recording. Um, using a broad range of media, including film, sound, performance, and sculpture, Aura's work and extensive research um, expands our ideas of what is seen and heard, especially around notions of the projected voice, um, through the histories, um, particularly of women, and experimentations with the technology. Her previous projects have seen her collaborate with women who have contributed to the evolution of technology in science and art through their pioneering experimentation and invention, such as the electronic um, music composer Daphne Oram and the filmmaker Liz Rhodes. Um, Aura completed a PhD at the Slade uh, School of Art and is currently a tutor of Mute Moving Image at the Royal College of Art here in London. Um, she was shortlisted for both the Samsung Art Plus Award and the Jarman Award for Film in 2012. And in 2015, she was awarded the Leverhulme Res Artist Residency in collaboration with the University of Southampton, which culminated in this fantastic exhibition at um, the John Hansard Gallery in 2016. Um, Aura has shown her work extensively um, across the country and internationally. I'm just going to name a few, including Tate Modern, um, the Hayward Gallery, John Hansard Gallery, Home, which is a fantastic space in Manchester. Um, and if you were lucky enough to be in Sydney in 2016, Aura's work was included in the Sydney Biennial that year, entitled The Future is Already Here, It's Just Not Evenly Distributed. Um, so most recently, um, you may have seen Aura's work in the Science Gallery at King's College London over the summer, where um, she presented her project Tuning Interference, Dark Matter Radio, uh, a fantastic piece uh, which um, involved in, actively involved your movement and your senses in quite an extraordinary way. Um, the work is actually touring to Dublin next year. Um, so in the spring, if you're in Dublin, please do visit the Science Gallery to see the work. Um, so please join me in welcoming Aura this evening. So to begin, Aura, um, we are standing here um, in the Sainsbury Wing at the National Gallery to look at this work um, by um, an unknown artist um, named by um, various academics as the Master of St. Veronica. Um, and the painting is titled St. Veronica with the Sudarium. Um, I know this is a painting that's kind of 
occupied you or been of interest to you for many, many years. Um, I wanted to ask how you first come across the painting and why you selected it to talk about this evening. So I was quite daunted when I was asked to do this talk because as a very young, almost teenager, I guess, 18-year-old visiting London for the first time, I came to the National Gallery, saw all these masterpieces and artworks, and I'd been thinking a lot around um, icons and contact relics, which maybe I can explain what that means in a moment. And this image really stood out to me. It's quite humble, it's anonymous, and I thought, what can I talk about in this context that would kind of allow me and, and prompt me to talk about other things that I'm really interested um, which in part also center around women and women's kind of alternative forms of writing. Um, I have actually written uh, when I did my PhD and thought a lot about this idea of the Veronica. And the Veronica is a portmanteau of the word um, vera icon, so true image, a true image of Christ. And legend has it that um, Saint Veronica offered Christ uh, a cloth, a sudarium, as he was um, uh, walking during the Passion, and when he wiped his face with it, it left an imprint. So his blood and his sweat left a, a stain of sorts. And although this is you know, somewhat unverified, we do have the Turin Shroud, I'm sure, or I wonder if people are familiar with this image, which is a, a sudarium, which has this kind of um, forensic quality. It's, a, mm. it's an abstract stain that is said to convey the image of Christ, the true image. So um, in some ways, it's a kind of genuine image, a genuine replica, almost a photographic imprint of sorts. And I suppose, thinking back to some of my interest in indexical images, so an image that is a sign of something else, just like um, smoke is an index of fire, or a fingerprint is an index or has a kind of causal relationship to the hand that made the fingerprint. This image, in theory, is a, is a true image or a true trace of um, Christ, and we don't have any likenesses. So it's kind of interesting. On the one hand, in this painting, it is uh, figurative, but if we compare it to the Turin Shroud, it's a kind of abstract stain that allows us to graft some kind of narrative reading onto mm. it. It's, we were talking earlier, uh, it's, I find this work really interesting because of that level of um, reproducing and illustrating an, an idea from a myth. So on one level, it's this image that's been produced as a relic, but also it's been um, reinterpreted again from a myth. So what you have as this image of Christ in the, in the painting is actually quite a glorious image of Christ. You know, his face, his image is kind of staring out at you. And it's not just a sort of abstract stain. Um, so it has this sort of level of translation again. What I find really interesting is that it kind of correlates with the way that we can approach your practice in a way, to think about how um, in your films um, and collaborations with various artists, you um, are looking at the traces of sound uh, and particularly electronic sound that has been processed through different mediums, um, translated into an image, perhaps, or a physical being, but also then translated back into sound and what mm. we might infer from that kind of form of translation and that mm. form of communication. Yeah, I mean, when I was talking earlier about the Akira Poyeton, which um, is the Greek word for an image not made by human hands, so this kind of image that, that magically comes into being through contact. So when I say a contact relic, I'm referring to this idea of proximity through touch. And there were other kinds of contact relics, such as um, you know, the mantle of the virgin. Or, um, but this idea of an image not made by human hands is one that I come back to again and again. Um, and I actually, I wanted to maybe show a little excerpt yeah, of the project that speaks to this. And I have several excerpts that speak to your question around mm -hmm. sound and sound writing. But maybe just as a kind of taster, you know, I think on the one hand, this idea of um, touch without touch or a kind of relic that comes into being without actually being the original. It's a trace. 
But on the other hand, it's also um, just going back to this idea of abstraction, a kind of Rorschach blot almost. So if you think of it as this stain that is then interpreted as something else um, from, from the Archaea Poeton, you can start to kind of suggest an idea of an alternative form of writing mm. or language or speaking. Um, so I wanted to show this piece which I did um, actually when I was pregnant and then re-performed it on multiple occasions. It's called Ventriloqua. And maybe while I um, show it, I'll just talk over it a little bit, although it does have sound. So basically, um, the thereminist Body. And what interested me here in this idea of ventriloquia is a kind of alternative form of speech, so belly speaking, alternative uh, mouths, alternative languages, but also this idea of an image that you see through. So what you're looking at on the one hand is apparent, you know, it's a belly and a hand activating the belly almost like a medium, but on the other hand, you're kind of meant to look through it. So when I was talking earlier about the Archaea of Poyoton as an index or an image that you see through. You look at it, but it, it is inhabited, animated by a whole range of other narratives that aren't necessarily evident here. And I think in my work, a lot of um, a kind of recurring leitmotif is this idea of a portal or a hinge or a doorway or of a kind of image that you look at and through at and through and it points elsewhere and maybe there's a kind of closer looking or a closer listening that enables you to kind of project into a different space and hear alternative voices, alternative histories. Is that what first drew you to, you know, using the theremin as an instrument? So the theremin is, a, is an instrument which um, is quite a modern instrument that uses these electronic kind of um, rods that you can, you don't actually touch. So as soon as you move closer to it, it produces a different sound. And you can use your another hand to kind of elevate the sound or kind of change the pitch. Um, and I wondered if that, you know, that kind of um, interest and, I mean, what drew, first drew you to using that instrument and then adapting it for, mm. for the performance? Well, going back to this idea of a stain as a kind of Rorschach blot or some kind of... Um, uh, material suggestion of uh, a code of sorts or some kind of, um, I suppose, a, a, quite an open, I'm going to call it a visual score of sorts. So you can read into it something, it might be a form of notation or a trace of sorts of some kind of writing, but that you read into it um, something that suggests uh, a, a code or, or a language, but it doesn't resolve itself. It's not settled, it's not semantically stable. And the theremin is exactly like that, unlike a piano where you have each note you know, standardized. With the theremin, you have to, what's called pitch fish, you have to find mm. um, the first note, and then from there, you construct the rest. So for me, um, going back to why I find uh, the idea of the stain so interesting, it's this idea of a, a suggestion of some kind of um, language that doesn't quite resolve itself. It's not a familiar language and there's an openness to it. And mm. <clears throat> maybe on that note, I can show a short excerpt of a film that I made with the filmmaker Liz Rhodes. Um, it's actually a 20 minute film, so this is a very short excerpt, but um, the way that it's structured is it uses optical sound on film. I don't know if people are familiar with um, older um, analog film where you have a sound wave. And the sound wave is basically the voice creating this imprint of light. And I suppose not dissimilar to this idea of an index or an image not made by human hands, you have this, this kind of sound writing made by the voice. And the way that we scripted this film and then kind of ran it through the optical sound camera generated these images, which are a true or an authentic image of the voice, so a sound print, much like today in computers you have a sound wave. But because of the way that it was structured, it has these kind of stroboscopic uh, flickering elements, and that flicker creates a kind of Rorschach blot. 
So I just want to show um, a minute and a half of that film. What is at stake in latching sound and image? The trace left behind shakes and trembles. It knows its own instability. Hinges swing. Light slivers. Tremulous, but not in fear. Losing the stability of a line. A mark of boundaries. Like a fire in a forest. Once a light, it flickers in everything. Light reveals its own shadows. Uncertain. Shifting. Upsetting the silence. Breaking the script. It is an open score. So just going back to this image, um, in some ways what I wanted to talk about in choosing this particular kind of Veronica um, metaphor, if you like, or the, the Akira Poyaton logic is this idea of a trace that is manifested that maybe suggests some kind of writing but isn't um, fossilized or isn't settled in a very kind of standardized form of interpretation. Um, and I suppose that brings me on to the next film. I don't well, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, just jump in. Um, before we move on, um, I found that project with Liz Rhodes particularly interesting. You, there was a sort of live version uh, where you performed with a, um, what's it called, the Rube, is it? A Rubens Tube. A yeah. Rubens Tube, um, which again was another form of sort of visualizing sound in some way. Mm -hmm. um, um, I wanted to bring it back um, again to the, your previous film as well in terms of the way, as a viewer, there's sort of um, an understanding of trying to interpret what these visual symbols might mean, what the imagery might mean. Um, but also, thinking back historically, who, um, thinking about who might have been the, pe uh, the people who were, who were interpreting these things, and thinking about um, seers and fortune tellers. Mm. Um, and particularly, often those roles were taken up by women. Um, and it's quite interesting that the, the whole myth around um, the Sudarium and, and St. Veronica is, is taken by a woman, you know, to, for her to kind of see this image in this piece of fabric. Um, and I wanted, wondered if you could talk a little bit to that about your interest particularly in um, these pioneering women, actually, who have thought about ways of communicating or interpreting language or through sound and technology mm. in different ways. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, my work, or maybe you said it, that you mm. know, my work has centered a lot around the history of sound technologies. And in this idea of sound writing, you know, certain voices get written and others are obscured or overwritten or not given space. And so this idea of like who gets heard and where the voices circulate and, and how we can kind of think about rewiring this and reinscribing the canon, this is really important to me. So, you know, we were just talking earlier about, you know, of all the works that one could have chosen here, it's precisely one that's kind of anonymous. And, you know, St. Veronica, although she is, you know, identified as such, there's also a kind of... Um, there's a humility to you know, her, her gesture even, which is a presentation of another image that is almost like a kind of mirror, you know, angled elsewhere. So it's not to look at her, it's to kind of look at it as a reflection of someone else. And I suppose um, in my interest in sound writing, 
um, you know, the particular voices that get obscured or written out of that history have been historically women and, of course, uh, non-white or kind of ethnic minorities. And so there's a sense in which we need to redress this canon and think about how we can bring those voices into different kinds of circulation. So I'm really committed to that um, and invested in it um, on many fronts, but also um, Going back to this idea of alternative forms of sound writing, the reason certain women in electronic music specifically are interesting to me is because um, within the forms that they invented of a kind of new, you know, if, if we assume that there's a given alphabet, there's a given form of music notation, you know, the stave and so forth, if you kind of shift that and think about instantiating a new kind of language or a new unheard of as yet, um, sound world, then that kind of opens up the space for an alternative possible way of being in the world. I mean, that might sound quite ambitious, but I do think of it in that way. Um, and in particular, you know, if you change the sound script, if you change the forms of sound writing, and then you change the soundscape, and then in turn you change the kind of listening that this enables, I I want to believe that that's kind of what we need more of. Um, and maybe now is a good time to show a short excerpt of my actually, film. Yeah, before sorry. we move on, I just wanted to talk to you a bit more about Liz Rhodes mm. and actually your relationship with Liz mm -hmm. Rhodes. Could you just um, talk a little bit about actually who Liz Rhodes is yeah. and her importance and yeah. how you came to collaborate and especially to make this film because it's a... I think oh, it's this a really isn't with her, the previous one was. Oh, the previous this one, yeah. This is with yeah. Daphne Oram, exactly. who passed away. I didn't meet her, unfortunately. Oh. But with um, Liz Rhodes, yeah. yeah um, Liz uh, taught me actually over 20 years ago when I was a student hmm. at the Slade. And she's an amazing uh, filmmaker in her late 70s now, an amazing writer and uh, thinker and uh, lots of yeah. uh, accolades. But she's very special to me, and we meet regularly and have conversations and Sometimes they've manifested as films, and other times, right now, we're writing a text together. Um, in many ways, my work is always about the space between voices and a kind of notion of a shared voice. And so I'm really, I, I like to think of my works as dialogues, both um, in terms of the subject matter, but also in terms of the method. Mm. And so the conversations with Liz are always feeding into this, as well as conversations with other people. Um, but maybe I'll show this film yeah. now. And then, and then we, can, we can talk yeah. about that relationship of being yeah. able to uh, have a conversation with an artist yeah. Yeah. again, but yeah. in a different way. So Daphne Oram was an electronic music pioneer. She's British, working in the late 60s. And she invented this machine called the Aramics machine, um, which used optical sound. So the thing I showed earlier, similar principle, but on a clear film. And essentially, she, she came up with a new form of sound writing, and um, it's a kind of sonic alphabet of sorts. It is as if the human being has thousands upon thousands of energy stores, each tuned for a purpose, each charged with a potential which allows it to sound forth. 
So I might just leave it, it playing in the background while yeah. we keep talking. Um, because I think the visuals of this, so, uh, this film are so interesting in the way that we think about how sound has been constructed through a physical film. You know, Daphne Oram was an amazing, amazing composer, um, experimenting with different technologies and pushing the sort of limits of what could be possible for electronic music. Um, it was Daphne Oram who created the, uh, was it Doctor Who? The um, she was part of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop yeah. and Delia Derbyshire was there composing elements of Doctor Who. I mean, okay. it's really interesting because yeah. going back to this idea of a kind of asemic <coughs> yeah. language or a language that doesn't quite have a, a, a clear um, direction, you know, if you yeah. think of electronic music, this is a new soundscape. It's not a sound that is made by a body that is familiar to us. So in those early days of electronic music, you know, there are two kind of interesting things to point out. One is that a lot of those sounds were relegated to either horror film or science fiction. Mm. And it's this idea of like, we don't know which body it has. And so it's kind of immediately either the abject or the, you know, the futuristic or the elsewhere. It's not the here and now that is familiar to us. And then um, at the same time, there's a sense in which for women in particular, you know, because music composition wasn't necessarily available to them as lots of forms of education weren't available to women, um, you know, historically, but to be able to write a piece of music and, get, and music and get an orchestra to perform it, you needed the contacts, you needed the money, you needed the investment. And electronic music short-circuited that because suddenly you could go straight from whatever it was that you were thinking in your mind to the performance of it without having to go through an interpreter or through the kind of um, structures and hierarchies that would have enabled it to come into speech. And so that's another reason that I've tended to focus on electronic music in addition to this idea of a kind of sound that doesn't quite, you know, is it a human, like the theremin, is mm. it human, is it machine, is it otherworldly, is it of this body? Mm. Um, and all of those things to me are, are full of potential, full of a kind of, uh, I suppose, I think of it as a kind of open, capacious language. It's mm. a language that doesn't shut down, but rather, when I was talking earlier about this idea of a portal or a doorway, it, it kind of points to other threads, mm. other possible, call it futures or possible presents. Um, yeah. And that is something that I really, I keep returning to in different ways and in different, uh, I suppose, incarnations. Sometimes it's specifically sound and sound writing, but other times it's, it's other forms of, um, you know, it's not necessarily the history of technology always, yeah. although that is really interesting to me for many reasons. Can we talk a little bit about the construction of the film? Um, you mentioned that um, Oram passed away many years ago, so you, didn't, you weren't able to have that conversation directly with her. But I feel there's something interesting in the way that you approached filming the, the machine, you know, this invented machine by her. Um, to kind of to speak and have a conversation with the way that she was thinking about um, about sound through these and um, through this way this way of making you know through that kind of immediacy of being able to kind of communicate and create a composition of, mm. you know mm. yeah I mean I as I said earlier like even when I'm not in conversation directly. The works are conversations in part with, um, with maybe historical figures in the past and kind of animating them into the present or bringing those voices back into circulation. So for me, having made the film about Daphne Oram, you know, I spent a lot of time with the archives. Mm. I read through her texts and manuscripts and her book and, um, yeah, I, I do think of it as a conversation. Hmm. Um, whether it was a kind of direct conversation or not. Um, I suppose it's because I think of my, you know, going back to the first image, hmm. the first film around ventriloquy, this idea of being an antenna or a medium or a kind of portal for another voice to appear. That's how I thought hmm. of myself in relation to making 
some of these films around historical figures that maybe have been overlooked. I mean, I made that film in 2011, and since then, Daphne Aram mm. has become much more well-known, and um, that machine was only discovered um, just before I, I made that film. It had been lost in some shed in France. And okay. so um, that idea of bringing her voice back into yeah. circulation and creating a space, carving out a space for her machine, for her aramics machine and form of notation to be visible and for her music and her voice to be audible um, was, was part of my practice as an artist. I mean, obviously, my voice is in it too, but I do think of myself as the space for other, you know, we're all always inhabited by other voices. Yeah. We're always sharing voices and speaking and being spoken through, and that's something that I really hold dear. Yeah. I think it's a good thing, you know, it's not, it's not a negative thing to be inhabited by other yeah. voices. It's something we should be more um, open to and embrace. Yeah. Which makes total sense in terms of your selection for this evening. Um, please join me in thanking Aura this evening and for sharing so much about your practice. Thank you. Thank you. For more information, please click on the link in the description. Thank you very much.